what's good, it's Wug. I want to talk a little Pink Floyd today, but specifically, I want to get into what I consider to be the most underrated Pink Floyd album in their entire discography. And it took place between their early era, that was the Sid Barrett-led era where they had the Piper at the Gates of Dawn album, and well before 1973's Dark Side of the Moon. This album is called Metal, M-E-D-D-L-E. And for, you know, most Pink Floyd, Floyd fans who might not be up on the, you know, Sid Barrett album and story, most Pink Floyd fans would, their Pink Floyd listenership would mostly fall in the span between Dark Side of the Moon, 1973, probably up into The Wall that took place at the end of the 70s. We're talking November 1979. And so everything in between Dark Side of the Moon and The Wall is kind of that, you know, the hot spot in terms of Pink Floyd being at the very peak of their stardom. Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, which came a couple years after, 1975, Animals, 1977, and then The Wall at the end of 1979. But there's this sweet spot in Pink Floyd's history that, you know, like a lot of artists, I tend to greatly appreciate the part of the career trajectory that was before they hit the all-time peak level commercially and just in terms of, you know, worldwide notoriety. Usually when the band is getting started and really getting their bearings about them, they're more willing to experiment and they are just, you know, totally immersed in the creation of their art to where they're taking more chances, they're developing their songwriting chops, and the music is getting better and better. And then I feel like when most artists hit that commercial peak, now you've got expectations. Now you've got the fear of, you know, losing what you had accumulated. Like you got to a certain point. Now, if you drop an album that they don't like as much, now all of a sudden your reputation is going to take a dip and your music's commercial viability is going to take a hit. They're just different pressures and distractions that superstar artists have to go through that when you're working up the rankings, so to speak, and working up the charts, you're not hit with that same pressure. They're different pressures, obviously. There's more of a financial pressure in terms of, you know, a lot of artists not making much money at all. But Pink Floyd specifically, they had the early era where Sid Barrett was basically one of the uh, most critically hyped and just an emerging singer-songwriter, pretty much the founder of the Pink Floyd at the time. So it was him, Roger Waters, Nick Mason, Richard Wright. David Gilmour doesn't, didn't come in until Sid Barrett started declining in mental health, you know, to where, I mean, mental health is what they would attribute it to today. You know, it could, whether it was LSD driven or not, we don't really know the answer to that. But basically, Sid Barrett released only a couple albums after being uh, essentially dysfunctional, like not showing up to band practice, or if you show up to band practice, then you start sabotaging the session by manipulating the guitar so it's out of tune and, you know, kind of playing something different when the band says, okay, we're gonna like practice this song, and then you start playing a totally different tune. Just different things like that ended up not being sustainable. He was slowly kind of driven out, kicked out of the group, and and then they had like the Saucer Full of Secrets album after Sid Barrett left, which Sid Barrett has one song on Saucer Full of Secrets. And that's basically the last song that he did with Pink Floyd called Jug Band Blues. But that first Pink Floyd album, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, that is songs written by Sid Barrett. He was the major guitarist. He was the major vocalist. And so it was basically Sid Barrett's band. He was the creative mastermind behind Pink Floyd. Once he left... They then brought in David Gilmour as he was exiting. So they had a few awkward, you know, sessions and shows with both Sid Barrett and then David Gilmour. So the, you know, mentally declining Sid Barrett's looking at this new guy, like who the heck is he? And then before you know it, Sid Barrett's out of the band. And then you've got a band without their leader who has to then pick up the pieces, recover, and basically forge a different path forward. So in that, you got a lot of um, work on soundtracks. Basically, Pink Floyd scoring certain movies. That's where you get Pink Floyd albums in between, like More, which was their uh, first soundtrack album. 
So they basically went from being the Sid Barrett led kind of psychedelic slash progressive rock band where, you know, Sid Barrett was very psych folk and just kind of off the beaten path in terms of his songwriting. A very unique style of songwriting. I mean, you could hear elements of his style in different bands around that 1967, 68 era. But after his exit, they were basically doing a lot more instrumental work where you've got several Pink Floyd songs from around this time that have no lyrics at all. So this is well before Roger Waters kind of took the helm of being the chief songwriter and visionary of the band. And so you had the newcomer into the band, David Gilmore, who's playing guitar, slide guitar, and then doing, I'd say about 50%, maybe slightly more than 50% of the vocals. So then you had Saucer Full of Secrets, you had more, you had Uma Guma, and then you have these two albums that really kind of signified the band's growth period. So they went basically glacial with a lot of their, for lack of a better term, soundscapes where they're just kind of tweaking this, tweaking this, trying to manipulate sound on different instruments, trying to make music using household appliances and just objects, trying to make music out of that. So they were basically just doing whatever seemed to work or whatever seemed interesting. Then it's like, okay, let's place more time into trying to develop that idea truly an experimental band. And this would obviously lead to those experimental feats on Dark Side of the Moon, like on On the Run or in the beginning of time where you've got all the clocks going off at the same time. Pink Floyd was emerging as the quintessential progressive rock band, experimental rock band. So their live shows were psychedelic in nature with all the light shows going on when Sid Barrett was still in the band. But then they started to develop a new reputation without Sid Barrett and they were basically very popular in Great Britain. So in the UK, they were already making a name for, for themselves by the time they get to this 1970 period where they have an album, Adam Heart Mother, which only has a few songs, but the runtime is still over 40 minutes because you've got one song called Adam Heart Mother that's over 20 minutes long. They would revisit this theme on this very next album, 1971's Metal. That's this one with the artwork where Strom Thurgeson, who made most of their album covers, actually really dislikes the album artwork for Metal, actually thinks that it did the band and the album a disservice. He thought it was that bad. I mean, he, I believe, wanted to actually make the album cover like a close-up of a baboon's anus or something like that. The band wasn't really with it. They said, okay, instead, let's make this like an ear underwater, which Storm, Storm Thurgeson, the artist who designs a lot of their stuff with his hypnosis company, didn't like that idea, and they made it, and him and his team really disliked the Pink Floyd album for metal. But Adam Hart Mother has a song. It's the title track, Adam Hart Mother, over 20 minutes long it has like different movements within the song and so this would almost serve as a precursor to the very next album metals final song echoes which is also over 20 minutes long it takes up the whole side two on the album vinyl so on the first side one you've got five songs you've got one of these days a pillow of winds fearless saint tropez and Seamus. and then on side two you just have Echoes, which is one of my favorite Pink Floyd songs ever. It's just the combination of the vocals between David Gilmour and Richard Wright, the keyboardist and kind of like the one of the musical masterminds of the band. I know that Roger Waters is seen as being like the creative visionary in terms of like the concepts of the songs and of the albums. He kind of assumed that role in the band and really prided himself on it. But instrumentally, I feel like David Gilmour, who was also the vocalist in most of the songs, even, you know, songs written by Roger Waters, David Gilmour would still be singing a lot of those songs. But him and Richard Wright are of the jazzier background to where they were more in tune with the music theory, the musical theory that would make Pink Floyd's instrumentals so damn rich and rewarding. But when you look at Adam Hart Mother and Metal, keep in mind, this again is before Roger Waters really just becomes the songwriting phenom that he's credited with being now. And so you've got a song like on Adam Hart Mother. It's like everybody you know, has songwriting credits for that 20 minute song that kicks off Adam Hart Mother, whereas 
Echoes actually is the end of metal. So you've got a 20 minute song to start Adam Hart Mother and then a 20 plus minute song to close metal. But you basically had a song from each member, except for uh, uh, Nick Mason didn't have like a, a song that he solely penned. But like If was a Roger Waters song. Uh, Summer 68 was a Richard Wright song and vocalized by Richard Wright. And If was vocalized by Roger Waters. But then you've got Fat Old Son, which was written by and vocalized by David Gilmour, and then everybody pretty much collabed on the last one, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast. By the way, if you listen to like Fat Old Son and uh, different parts of Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast, which in itself is a 13 minute song, about half as long as Adam Hart Mother, but you start hearing little pieces that are gonna resurface later on on their more famous works, like on Dark Side of the Moon's Brain Damage, Breathe, um, and then some of the works on Wish You Were Here, and so forth. You start hearing some of these musical ideas come together on Adam Hart Mother, and then the album that followed, Metal. Now, I like Adam Hart Mother. I really like Adam's, uh, Alan's Psychedelic Breakfast. I like Fat Old Son. I like Summer 68, the Richard Wright song. I don't like the Roger Waters solo song, If, as much, nor do I like Roger Waters' solo song on metal called San Tropez. I don't know. There's just like this type of like dad rock, yacht rock that is associated with Roger Waters' early authored songs that I'm just not really digging as much as some of the other stuff. So when you go from Adam Hart Mother to Metal, Metal, again, they have the song Echoes, which like Adam Hart Mother starts with the theme, which I really love the metal theme. It just, it's the part that starts with the overhead, the albatross. And the writing on this one is actually likened to the John Lennon penned across the universe. People see the similarities in how existential the songwriting is on Echoes, like it is on that John Lennon uh, Beatles classic from the Let It Be album, Across the Universe. It's been covered several times by Fiona Apple and others. But if you listen to metal and specifically the closing song, the 20 plus minutes echoes, you hear that very stony, slow, kind of swooning sound that is so, so Pink Floyd. Think, you know, uh, brain damage. The lunatic is on the grass, right? On towards the end of Dark Side of the Moon. It's just that very, you know, Pink Floyd takes their time on these songs. And that's been a hallmark of their music. Yes, their stuff got more lyrical as the years continued and as Roger Waters became a more emboldened songwriter. But if you listen to metal, it kicks off with One of These Days, which is a driving dun -da 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 -dun -da 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 rock song that's an instrumental, but it's very unlike most other Pink Floyd stuff, especially from this era. So basically, they were not afraid to try new ideas. So listen to how riveting that One of These Days songs is. And keep in mind, Pink Floyd's music builds and it's often had that kind of building quality so one of these days it starts off with the lick then halfway into it it just shoots off and you feel like you've been shot out of a cannon by the last you know exhilarating two minutes of one of these days i really love that song i like putting it on like running and workout and jogging playlist actually now they go from that riveting one of these days opener to a pillow of winds. A pillow of winds is like the opposite of one of these days. Super laid back and just stony and just, it sounds like a pillow of winds. It actually is not too dissimilar from like the opening to breathe. So when you hear, you know, David Gilmour getting on the guitar and on the slide, when you hear the instrumental kick off on a pillow of winds, it reminds you of what's to come on albums like Dark Side of the Moon. So A Pillow of Winds, besides Echoes, might be my favorite song on metal. Now, the song after Pillow of Winds, Fearless, that's kind of recognized as maybe being the best song. Best versus favorite, it's a distinction. But Fearless, it, you know, it has like these soccer stadium chants halfway into the song, has a really cool guitar riff, which you hear it and you're like, damn, I, I feel like I've heard this guitar riff like my whole life, but I can't quite put my finger on it. You might or might not have heard Fearless before. It's not one of their popular singles or anything like that. In fact, Pink Floyd, one of the things that they had going against them when they were still a, a strictly UK phenomenon before they crossed over with Dark Side of the Moon into the United States, which 
you know, metal didn't sell well in the U.S. Just like Adam Hart Mother didn't sell well in the U.S. Pink Floyd was not a singles type of rock act, which made the marketability a little tougher because it's like a, you know, the album is greater than the sum of its parts type of idea with all Pink Floyd stuff. I would say including Dark Side of the Moon, even though that was phenomenally commercially successful. Pink Floyd is not a singles type of band, but Fearless could kind of parlay as a single. It could serve as a single, even though it's like six minutes long, which would have violated the rules of the single before Led Zeppelin came with Whole Lot of Love and basically changed the game and said, no, we're not going to put out, you know, singles onto the radio. Instead, we're going to use this new FM, you know, radio option and play these longer, more expanded songs. So that worked perfectly with, you know, Pink Floyd's material, but their stuff is so non-single rock, even in sound, to where it's hard to it's hard to imagine it fitting in with the playlist of the day because we're talking 1970 here. But Fearless, if they did have a single from Metal, I guess it would be Fearless. But yeah, I, I mean, I think that Pillow of Winds would have been a beautiful. It's a very soft and tender type of song, which is another you know quality of a lot of Pink Floyd's music. Pillow of Winds followed by Fearless. San Tropez, which is the next song, is that that's the Roger Waters one that sounds a little bit more dun 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 dun. Sounds a little bit middle of the road style rock. Not my favorite, but you know it made the album, and it was Roger Waters basically, you know, just getting more comfortable with songwriting. That's how I see it. And then Seamus, which features a sample of one of their dogs, somebody's dog. I forgot if it was Nick Mason's or somebody's dog was named Seamus. That's how the song earned its name. So about two minutes long and it's more like of a you know it's a bluesy track blues guitar song with like kind of faded vocals you could barely hear the vocals in the song but it was very experimental just a couple minutes of like psychedelic blues if you will and then it goes from Seamus into Echoes the epic song to close out metal which again I look at that as being one of the absolute best Pink Floyd songs along with like Breathe from Dark Side of the Moon or Time from Dark Side of the Moon or Shine On You Crazy Diamond from Wish You Were Here. But Metal, that was the greatest sign of things to come when, you know, because Metal was a couple years into the works. They were working on the elements that made that song, I mean, Echoes. They were working on the elements that made the song Echoes way back when they were working on albums like, you know, Adam Hart Mother and even Uma Guma before that because they were so experimental working in these different, you know, from Abbey Road Studios to lesser known, smaller studios basically so they could hone their chops in working on all of these different experimentations while they were just relentlessly touring. Because they were touring for the couple years leading up to 1973's Dark Side of the Moon for a few years. So they had a rigorous touring schedule and on their off time, they would be working on these songs and these early ideas, these experimentations that would then later become this fully fleshed out Echoes song at the end of Metal. So yeah, I love where this album is positioned in the Pink Floyd discography. Again, Metal is between Adam Hart Mother and then after Metal, they had one more album called Obscured by Clouds and then they released Dark Side of the Moon, their you know masterpiece, their Mona Lisa, even though some people's favorite Pink Floyd album might be the one after that, Wish You Were Here or two albums later, Animals or three albums later, The Wall. I think Metal is the most underrated Pink Floyd album. Let me know if you think that another one would actually qualify as being more underrated. Like, let me know if you think Obscured by Clouds is more underrated. Or even one of their later, later works like 1994's The Division Bell or 87's Momentary Lapse of Reason or The Final Cut, one of those albums. Let me know if you think that one of those is more underrated than Metal. But I look at Metal as being not only their most underrated album, but it also represents the direction that Pink Floyd had kind of, that they were heading in and that was being forged musically to make them basically one of the greatest um, psych rock bands ever, progressive prog rock bands ever. You can't not be prog rock with that level of experimentation. But yeah, let me know if you've heard metal. Let me know if you like metal as much as I do. Let me know if you if you hate their album cover as much as Storm Thorgerson, its designer, 
disliked the album cover. Please let me know what you think in the comments. I actually want to do a follow-up to this where I'm talking about that two album back-to-back -back between Adam Hart Mother and Metal. But Metal to me is just such a pleasant album to listen to. It obviously gets sandwiched between the early Sid Barrett, the Piper of the Gates of Dawn, and uh, Arnold Lane, C. Emily Play era, and then the Dark Side of the Moon and Beyond eras. This is kind of, again, that sweet spot where they are really finding themselves and really making some of the most interesting stuff in their entire discography on the way to more lucrative pastures, if you will. But yeah, let me know what you think. Uh, please like the video, subscribe to the channel if you love music like I do. I'm Wood. Thanks for tuning in.